As always, I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to stand before you once more on this beautiful Lord's Day. It's also nice to be able to see the sunshine trying to poke through the clouds. Certainly thankful for all the rain, but beginning to wonder whether or not we need to build an ark. This morning, if you would like to be turning to the second chapter of the book of Acts, I would like for us to discuss a passage that I know that each and every one of us is familiar with. In fact, we typically cite it as part of God's plan of salvation. Again, that's Acts chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 37 and 38. On that day of Pentecost of long ago, the apostles stood up and they began preaching God's word, God's will for them at this time. And as he's drawing, I guess you could say somewhat of a conclusion, the people rose up and asked what needed to be done. So there in verse 37, the inspired Luke records there for us. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now in particular, it's that last phrase that we would like to discuss this morning. Many today, and quite for some time, have attempted to interpret and even rephrase this last bit of the verse to say, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost as a gift. They might not specifically rephrase it that way, but that's still the ideology that they live by. Thus, when one, went, when one obeys the gospel, he or she receives a measure of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, And the Holy Spirit actually directly impacts the heart of the one converted. Now this is a very attractive view because it's an easy view. Thus it's a very popular view. Because if the Spirit directly contacts my heart, everything that I do from that point forward could easily be said, the Spirit guided me. Though this is indeed a popular view, It is a false view. And this morning I would like for you to study with me, pointing out why it is false and then pointing to the correct way. First and foremost, I would like to point out that this claim is grammatically incorrect. You see, in the Greek, the word receive is a transitive verb. Thus requires a direct object in this sentence. Well, the direct object in this phrase, this sentence, is the word gift. Not the Holy Ghost himself. Thus, the the promise is a gift given by the Holy Ghost and not the Holy Ghost himself. We must consider Romans chapter 6 verse 23 as well as Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 which says that there is a gift of God. Well, this gift is something that God himself gives, but it is not God himself that is the gift. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, we're told that there is a gift of Christ. Christ himself is not the gift mentioned there, though there is something he would give. Now others, in attempting to prove this false view of the Holy Spirit being the gift mentioned here in verse 238 might also allude to Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 through 11 as well as Luke chapter 11 verses 10 through 13 and they there Jesus is telling his apostles that whatever they ask shall be given to them well these passages metaphorically use the giver of the gift to show the gifts that he will be giving. Now, combining all three of these passages, 
They provide an inspired commentary, an infallible commentary, on the purpose and mission of the Holy Ghost. So there are basically two views, in addition to the truth, that one might take from this passage of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. First one we ask, is there a literal, personal measure of the Holy Spirit that is received at the point or even following baptism? Now some hold this to be true. And in so doing, they are upholding the concept that the Holy Spirit directly impacts the converted heart separate and apart from the New Testament doctrine. Thus claiming the gifts are received through the Word. This view raises some issues. The Word of Truth, God's Word, the Gospel of Christ is admittedly received before baptism. Otherwise, how would we know we needed to be baptized? Secondly, this false view requires that the Spirit Himself is received by means other than the Word of Truth. Now, if the Spirit Himself is the gift, then it must be due to a direct impact and personal experience of the Spirit upon the heart of the one converted. If this is the case, he does so in addition to and apart from the Word of God, the Word of Truth. To claim the Spirit as his own person is the gift given of Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and that he is received after hearing and obeying the gospel, while still maintaining and insisting that the Holy Spirit is received by the word of truth, is to be guilty of rather daring and glaring inconsistency and faulty reasoning. You cannot hold to both of them and still they both be correct. Either the Holy Spirit resides in the heart of the converted, the Christian, being received as a gift, following baptism or he is there by means of the word of truth which he gave you cannot have your cake and eat it too but you see both of these views are false now to claim that the Holy Spirit is the gift of Acts chapter 2 verse 38 is to be in direct conflict with Acts chapter 3 verse 19 Acts chapter 3 verse 19 reads, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Well, we must note, and it's easily seen, that both of these verses, Acts 2.38 and Acts 3.19, contain four elements. Let's break them down accordingly. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent. Acts chapter 3, 19, repent ye. Acts 2, 38, be baptized every one of you. Acts chapter 3, 19, be converted. Now this act of converting or turning, if you would, is followed by belief and repentance. Thus is a reference to baptism. Acts chapter 11 verse 21. Next. Acts 2.38. For the remission of sins. 3.19. That your sins may be blotted out. And our fourth element. Acts 2.38. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then 3.19. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Clearly, the gift of the Holy Ghost is compatible to the times of refreshing as referenced in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It must then be explained how the Holy Ghost indwells the child of God. Especially if 
the Holy Spirit gives no awareness of him ever doing so. If he provides no method of teaching of the truth to that individual. Third, offers no protection from any sort of error. And fourth, requires them to submit to a book that is written over 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years ago for guidance. Is there any wonder then that those who would hold to this doctrine move that the Holy Spirit acts separate from, the, from the, the written word of Christ? Just what is this gift of God then? The, Holy, the gift of the Holy Ghost, that is, as mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It cannot be the, the actual person of the Holy Spirit, and as some might claim, it's a gift that He gives through the written word. Neither of those can be the case. This gift must be something, must be something given by the Holy Ghost, it is a miraculous bestowal of power. This power could be transferred by the laying on of hands of the apostles. Now we would note that this act was not simply and only were dependent upon one's baptism. It was not a necessary consequence of baptism. Third, it was a promise that was limited to the early church, the early stage of the church, while the word of truth was to be revealed and written down, while that word was being confirmed, thus the purpose of miracles. Now this bestowal of power was promised by Christ in Acts chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. He promised that to his disciples, specifically his apostles. Now the phrase, the gift of the Holy Ghost, occurs two times in the New Testament. We've already read one of them, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The second occurrence is Acts chapter 10, verse 45, and the verses following. Now, 238 references the point where the Jews would receive this gift of the Holy Ghost, and Acts chapter 10 points to when the Gentiles would receive it. Both of these events show a miraculous bestowal of a miraculous gift. Now, wherever these apostles went, they preached, and ultimately they baptized. And upon doing so, they would confer these miraculous gifts by the laying on of hands. Now, each of these gifts, the act of laying on the hands, was necessary for the edification of that early church, especially, especially given the fact that the people that they baptized were in a specific geographical location. They needed that edification. Now these miraculous gifts were to work in the absence of a written record. We read of Peter and John in Acts chapter 8 verse 12 and verses 14 through 17 where Peter and John laid hands on those Philip baptized. You see, Philip could not lay hands on others to bestow these miraculous gifts. It had to come from an apostle. So you have Peter and John doing so. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, we can read where Paul had laid hands on those who were baptized. Then we see in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, where Paul stated that he desired to visit Rome so that he could impart some spiritual gift upon them. And we must note two things from each of these passages. The Christians, those who were converted to the law of Christ, received these gifts not by being baptized, but by having the hands of these apostles laid upon them. And secondly... The apostles themselves had to be present to impart those gifts. If a written word, a written letter was sufficient to do so, they would have done it. But as we, as we referenced in Romans 1.11, it could not do that. They had to be present in order to bestow these gifts upon them. 
If all of this is the case, just whom were these promises made to? Was the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, promised to those on Pentecost who repented and were baptized? Yes, it was. This promise is very similar to Mark chapter 16, verse 16, was given to the same group. Now, do the signs mentioned here in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, follow all those who believe and are saved today? I was getting a little worried on our Bible class study this morning, and that's where we were going. Well, are those signs following believers today? Absolutely not. Now, this, this promise was given to all those who complied. Those on Pentecost were promised the gift of the Holy Ghost. These instances were limited to the apostolic age of the church. These signs were obviously miraculous in nature can you imagine getting bit by a rattlesnake and then nothing happening to you I know many people would prefer that happen that just does not happen nowadays and we're going to consider that a little bit later on in the lesson now if we claim this to be true the same must be true about the gift of the Holy Ghost. If the things in Mark 16 were true, then the same would be true about Mark or Acts chapter 2 verse 38. It would be limited in nature, though miraculous. We must therefore conclude that the signs of Mark chapter 16 verses 16 through 18 were necessary while inspiration was in men. Miracles serve their purpose. And thus ended when inspiration was taken from man and put into an infallible book. It was written down and recorded. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, <coughs> verses 8 through 13, the inspired Paul pens, Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man... I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am also known. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. You see, miracles had their time, they had their purpose. It was specifically for the infant church that had just come into existence. So anyone claiming to be able to use miracles today, they're admitting their own ignorance in several ways. Verse 11 references a child. You know, children need extra guidance. They need extra teaching. They need extra instruction. And most of the time, they need extra discipline. But when they grow and develop to the point where they can understand more, they can do better on their own. We don't have to apply the same type of discipline. We don't have to apply the same type of instruction, though their learning does not cease. You see, our brethren of the first century were experiencing a new thing, that is, the church of our Lord and Savior. We have the benefit of the Bible. They did not. They had the Old Testament scriptures, but they also needed to be instructed miraculously on the law of Christ. He also says that which is perfect has come. In verse 10. This is exactly how James could boldly say that. We have the perfect law of liberty. James chapter 1 verse 25. Only a perfect or complete law. 
can make the man of God complete or perfect. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. If it still needed to be revealed, it could not do that. We would not be complete or perfect by adhering to its teachings. Next, some other points to consider. We know from Acts chapter 2, verse 39, that Peter declared a promise. There in verse 239, he says, You, this promise is given to you. Well, the you there is the Jews. He says, After that, your children, this promise is given. Well, that would be the children of the Jews. And then he makes the statement, All that are afar off. Well, that would be no doubt the Gentiles of the day. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. You see, this is the fulfilling of a promise that God made to the great patriarch Abraham. Back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. Thus, salvation was made available to not only the Jews, but to the Gentiles also, through Abraham's unique descendant, that is, Jesus the Christ. Now, some would look to Acts chapter 5, verse 32, and they would seek to abuse this verse in order to push their false doctrine, their error, and, they, and by doing so, they rend it from its context. Acts chapter 5, verses 29 through 32, which reads, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. You see, they take verse 32 away from the scenario, the context in which it's given. And they try to say that the Holy Ghost is given to all those that believe. And that we today are witnesses of those things talked about. Just what are these things? That's exactly what he referenced in verse 30 and 31. The resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to heaven. No one alive today can say that they witnessed the resurrected Lord. Nor could they say they, they witnessed his ascension to heaven. But the apostles could. They were to whom this gift was given. And to those whom they laid their hands on. Now, in preparing for this lesson, I, I found a, a quote that I particularly like for this, this issue. And I think it certainly applies at this point. A text taken from its context becomes a pretext. You see, if you pull a, a verse or a group of verses out of its context, you can abuse it however you wish. But that doesn't mean it's correct does not mean you have a correct doctrine that you're making. Context matters. Now to those who would claim that Acts chapter 5 verse 32 and passages similar apply to us today, we ask, if this is the case, can you provide any evidence for Christianity that is not written down? That was the exact purpose of these miraculous gifts. So if you have the measure of the Holy Ghost, give some supporting evidence that we don't have currently. No one that claims to have that ability can do so. The apostles had that ability, so they could do that. Not only could they, but they did. No such power exists today because they're not needed. We have the complete written word of God in our possession today. Now, 
Now, when you, in considering the different types of personalities, one of which that I, I guess you could say I am, I would say that I am, I prefer having things written down because my memory is not all as, as good as most folks might have. If I forget something, I can go back and reference what was written down. And if somebody tries to change what they said, I can go back and say, well, no, this is what you claimed. This is what you taught. We have that same ability through the Word of God. If we want to know what God's mind is on a given subject, we can reference His book. We can know the mind of God by seeking out His Word, reading it, studying it, and properly applying it. Now for those making these claims that charge that we do have modern day miracles, and when you go and try to dispute that fact with them, that no miracles do not occur today, they charge you with, you just don't believe in miracles. I absolutely believe in miracles. I'll read you a couple if you want. That's the exact purpose of the first four books of our written New Testament. You see, these miracles were recorded for the same purpose that they were performed. That we might believe in Christ and in so doing might have life through His name. John chapter 20 verses 30 through 31. Now the only faith that saves today is the only one that comes from the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse, 20, verse 17. Anybody else who, who might claim to have faith from another source is a liar. If they claim to have the ability to perform miraculous gifts, they are a liar. We have examined that in the light of God's Word this morning. Now upon studying God's Word, upon reading His will for us, we know that there are conditions of salvation. As we've read today in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, we must repent and be baptized. Mark chapter 16, 15 through 16, as well as Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Those conditions of salvation apply to us today. We must not be guilty of taking things that applied in the first century and applying to us today when they are not applicable today. Now, if you are not a child of God, why not comply with the terms of salvation this morning. If you continue in sin, you have nothing to expect out of this life when this life is older, over. In fact, you will be granted a devil's hell with all those who have chosen to be rebellion against God. However, if you are a child of God, yet through your ignorance perhaps, weakness no doubt, have allowed sin back into your life, why not have that sin removed through the cleansing blood of our Savior, Jesus the Christ, through repentance and prayer? Whatever the need might be this morning, please make it known to us here as we stand and sing.